So by aligning interests with the installer and giving them skin in the game, they're much more incentivized now to make sure that that customer's happy. Not that they're totally disincentivized before, but now you're totally aligning interests. If that's the real reason why people don't pay their bill, then aligning interests with the installer, I think is gonna go even further to continue to lower that default rate and provide better funds for the cash equity providers. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick Podcast where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I would like to thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast is Schwerd Consulting. Schwerd Consulting is a leading solar consulting firm dedicated to design, engineering, owner's representation, and technical consulting in all areas of solar, photovoltaics, and energy storage for the commercial, industrial, and utility markets. At Schwerd Consulting, they like to say, we know solar, we just don't do solar. What sets them apart is their 100% focus on solar, while having an extensive background in building and utility engineering and understanding the business of our clients. We're they're involved with the trends, technologies, vendors, policies, utilities, codes, and financial considerations for the industry. Therefore, value add for them is not just a slogan, it's what they practice in order to have a loyal customer base and gain trust. Short Consulting has been in business for nine years and has provided services for approximately one gigawatt of PV across over 800 sites in 17 states plus the Caribbean. Let Schwerd Consulting take the burden off of you and bring ease and expertise in all areas of engineering and design or help you navigate the technical world of solar. If you're interested in learning more about Schwerd Consulting, you call them at 215-219-6718. That's 215-219-6718 or email to admin at schwerdconsulting.com. Schwerd Consulting's website is www.schwerd, S-H-W-E-R-D, consulting.com. We'll also have that in the notes of the podcast. I've known Steve for 15 years. Him and his team does an amazing job with their clients and I appreciate him supporting the podcast. And he's also been on several episodes of the Solar Maverick podcast. So definitely check it out through our catalog. And thank you for listening. Let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm excited to have my co-host, Nathan Giovanelli. Nate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me as always. It's always a ton of fun. Yeah, definitely. Nate's now been on more than 10, maybe, episodes of the Solar Maverick Podcast. If you go to his website, www.giovanelli.io, you can see the different episodes of the Solar Maverick Podcast. He also has his own podcast called the Limitless Podcast that you should definitely check out. And he's also has this other interviews as well, the other podcasts that he's been on. If you don't know Nate, just brief background on him is Nate helps residential solar businesses grow faster by creating better finance products, making connections and reducing solve costs via software optimization and innovative hardware. As I said before, he's the owner of Giovanelli LLC, it's a premier renewable energy consulting firm, serves as an advisor and board member to several companies. And most recently, he started Sunrace Capital, where he's serves as a CEO, which I'm excited to learn about. Let's get into it, Nate. The last interview, you reminded me that I didn't say that. So it's (laughs) interesting how people remember certain catchphrases. We've talked about actually, Nate, your your background in the past, how you were an entrepreneur at IGS Solar, which it's part of one of the biggest third party energy companies. And then you created their solar division that basically provided third party ownership to residential customers. You've started Started your own now with Sunrays Capital, a residential TPO company. How is Sunrays different from IGS Solar and what needs are you solving in the industry? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So again, I love being on, so I appreciate it. It's always a blast. I always enjoy talking to you. And it's funny because I purposely, we didn't talk too much about it prior to the interview because I wanted you to be naturally curious and answer and ask questions that other people were thinking. So it's a great start. For those that don't know my full background, 
And about 10 years ago, I started IGS Solar, as you said, which is a sister company to the largest independently held energy company in the country. So they have a few million customers for gas and electric. They're a commodity supplier. And we eventually pivoted that business into a residential solar division where we deployed well over a billion dollars in the space. We did seven funds with lots of big infrastructure companies. And all those funds, just like the publicly traded companies today, they utilize a structure for the federal investment tax credit, the 30% tax credit that you get for going solar. They leverage this structure. It's basically a partnership flip. And what that means is that they partner with these big banks who own 99% of the project for the first five years. And the banks are taking all the tax or that 30% tax credit out of the job because in a TPO structure, the homeowner can't take that credit because they don't own the system. So it's not like a loan or a cash deal. In order to be more tax efficient, which it is more efficient in several ways, like the banks can take depreciation, they can mark up the project costs or whatever the sponsor or the cash equity paid, they can actually take the tax on a greater basis than that based on value added to get the project done. And that's called step up. So there's all these things that you can do in that traditional tax equity structure, partnership flip, but it's also very limiting in a lot of ways and creates a ton of friction. So quite simply, during my tenure at IGS, we were really good working with the top, say, 20 installers. We worked with almost all the top 20 turnkey installers. The ones that are large installers that use sales of works, we didn't never really tailored our tech toward that. And frankly, we also didn't compete on price. We competed on value. So we struggled with sales orgs because they might not see the downstream benefits of working with an IGS candidly, and they're more focused on a price-driven sale, generally speaking. But what we were able to do was hone in on those top large turnkey installers and create a process through technology that was much simpler, that didn't box them in, that gave them a lot of the decision-making, the power to choose what design tool they're going to use to propose the system within regulations and rules and compliance, but they could use their own proposal. There's all these things we didn't box them in. We didn't solve for the lowest common denominator. But there's one thing you can't do to summarize everything I'm talking about in a traditional structure. And it's the same thing that, frankly, every large installer I've run into once. And that's quite simply to have part ownership of the fund. We used to get asked all the time from large customers, can we put our name on the contract and can we own part of the fund? And generally, the answer to that in a partnership flip is no, they're not a party to the contract. So it's kind of confusing. But then they did originate the deal. They did install it. So whose customer is it? That's always a friction point. And then I would always tell them too, like on the cash equity side, these fund returns are pretty low. It's an asset backed security. So you're not looking at these crazy high returns, right? You can back lever the project or get cheaper debt and kind of juice your return a bit. But at the end of the day, most installers would be better off taking that money and growing their business. However, the tax component has great returns. It's just that they couldn't participate in that until last year when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed and everything changed. So a little bit of a long history, but it's important because what the IRA now allows us to do is transfer those tax credits pretty much to anyone that's an overgeneralization. We're still working out passive versus active income through the IRS and what the guidance there is. The final rule should be out this year, but for all intents and purposes, any C-Corp, anyone with passive income surely can monetize the tax. So what does that mean? Instead of having this very complex partnership flip structure, you can transfer the tax to somebody like Benoit, if you have passive income through all your ventures, right? You could buy these tax credits, say 95 cents on the dollar. So you give me 95 cents, I give you a dollar of tax credit. You instantly made, you know, your 5% because you're going to offset that tax. So we can do the same thing with installers. So we can aggregate or just take, say, the six to 12 of the largest installers and take a lot of friction out of the deal by aligning interest and giving the installers the ability to own equity in the fund. And this solves a whole bunch of problems, right? It goes back to now it is their customer, so they can service that customer. Why is that important? Because I've been on both sides of the table for M&A transactions in this space. So for acquisitions of all different types and what I've seen and when I'm out talking to private equity, they don't really value solar companies the same as they do like an HVAC company or plumber because of that reoccurring revenue new component is always plagued the industry. They look at it as you go install the solar, it's someone else's customer, generally speaking, and you don't know if you're going to ever need to service it or if they're going to call you. So you don't get that benefit where if you 
put in an HVAC, the customer is going to call you for service, or maybe you have an annual service plan, right? And all these other things. And the private equity really values that recurring revenue. So now imagine you're an installer, you install thousands of these systems a year. Let's just say you make $5 million and you pay $5 million in taxes. So whatever you're, that would back out to your income, you can participate in the fund and offset your tax. And even if it's 5% of the fund, if that's all that you can buy in for, because that's your whole tax appetite with depreciation, you get this reoccurring revenue stream that just snowballs every year from these customers, right? What that does is that now gives you a much greater enterprise value because you're getting this reoccurring revenue that is frankly kind of the missing piece to get those frothier evaluations if you ever go exit your business or sell. So there's a lot of components here that we can dive into. It simplifies the transaction on the tax side. I mean, you're talking about some a thousand page partnership flip contract that's very technical and detailed and complicated. It's like a three page tax transfer agreement to anyone, right? In the space. So they would buy the remainder of the tax. You could transfer it to anyone you want. This does a lot. There's customer benefits. It has benefits the whole way through the value stack. But I'm going to stop there because I just said a lot and just kind of see what questions you have and where you want to go from there. But we can go into the nitty gritty of all the other tangible benefits and why it's better than a partnership flip. But in a nutshell, what we're doing 20,000 feet is we are creating funds where the installer can participate in the upside of their fund to increase their company's value. Yeah, I appreciate you explaining, Nate. That's really helpful. And transferability is a huge aspect of the Inflation Reduction Act. And obviously, you mentioned a great point about the active or passive income and the IRS is still like finalizing the rules and it simplifies taking advantage of the tax incentives. If people are not familiar, you know, there's basically a 30% investment tax credit. That's a big federal government incentive. And part of the IRA that was passed a little more than a year ago, the Inflation Reduction Act also has adders related to, you know, if you use prevailing wage or unaffordable housing or domestic manufacturing panels and equipment. So it's definitely like a huge thing of certainty, right? The tax policy would go year to year or two to three years, now goes for 10 years with this new program. I just wanted to kind of, because I know you're talking about a lot of different things and I know we have like a wide range of listeners on here. So I think that's huge with the transferability. Basically, I think the real return, right, is the ability not to pay taxes because you invest in the solar project. And to simplify the process, as you said, with the three-page agreement, instead of a convoluted, complicated partnership flip model, which you were talking about, the typical structure, which is the 99-1, where basically the tax equity partner takes which is usually a bank, but it's also corporates as well. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and they basically take 99% of the tax attributes. And then basically the developer or installer takes that 1%. And then there's a flip where once all the tax attributes are taken and there's a certain return that the tax equity return has received, there's usually a flip. And usually that flip happens on the seventh year, depending on the cash flows of the project. And then the ownership structure flips where the tax tax equity investor has 95% of the ownership versus five in a typical structure. I mean, I've structured these deals in the past, so I just kind of wanted to talk about that because I think, you know, there's a lot of detailed information that you said in there. And you're right, like what you're talking about is a lot easier of a structure and also keeps the installer and developer in the project and that will create higher quality projects, right? You want to talk about that because that's a huge part. Most of the times though, I would say the installer, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, or developer gets the O&M contract, right? For these assets or no? Yeah, that's how we do it. So whoever is building the project, we want them to be the one that's servicing it. They know it better than everyone. They have all the plans, right? You're going to have to have a backup just in case there's a lot of things that could happen. They can't get there at a certain timeline, things like that. But ultimately, Sunrays, we're a technology platform that's enabling this and also performing all the asset management and everything else for the fund itself. In this structure, you know, in overarching cash equity player and there'll be JV set up below that. So every installer will be part of their own JV where they'll own a certain percentage, effectively whatever percentage makes sense to offset their tax. So it's going to make them super sticky. And I think the other important thing that you noted was in my experience at IGS, we deployed tens of thousands of homes and I personally talked to a lot of customers. One of the things that always stuck out to me was what I would consider, I'm sure there's people that are going to disagree with this, but arbitrary 650 FICO score. And what I'm going to drive to is 
quality. Why I'm starting with FICO is because this FICO score is generally dictated by the banks that are taking the tax equity. And then also, if you're getting back leverage or debt, they want to know that you're not going to have this huge default so that you can service the debt. So just taking a half a step back to explain that, there's three legs of a stool in a traditional resi fund, generally speaking. There's your tax equity, and we'll just say it's going to be like Bank of America, US Bank. It's going to be a big bank. It's your cash equity, which is going to be like a BlackRock. It's an infrastructure fund, right? That's just one that yes. I think people know. And then there's debt. Like we used ING. So there's another bank that's giving you sure. debt. So if you have a 7% cash equity return and you get 4% debt, now all of a sudden your assets are returning higher because you're basically using cheaper money to pay for the projects. And then you're just getting that bump or that levered return. I'm trying to think of how to really simply explain it. Generally, what I've found in all of my experience is that the 650 FICO is dictated by the tax equity and the debt. Right now, it's not a good environment to get debt. I think everyone listening can appreciate that. Interest rates have gone up faster than any time in history. They're back up at post 20 year highs. So it's going to be hard to find cheaper money to leverage your asset. And I think there's an advantage there. So if I don't have a bank, I'm transferring the tax to a company or an individual and I attach a tax insurance to that, which you can get, which basically says, yes, this meets all the criteria. It's not going to get clawed back. It's not going to get recaptured, as they say. So basically, the insurance company is doing the diligence so that the buyer is comfortable that, yes, this is coming. I don't need to look at it. This tax credit hasn't been resold. It hasn't been all these things because how it's worded now, the actual burden rests on the transfer E, not the transfer or. So like if you bought the tax from my projects, it's your burden to say, yes, this tax credit is good. So you can avoid that and avoid all the brain damage associated by getting insurance products. So that's generally what we would do as the seller of the tax credit. We'll go out, we'll partner with a large insurance company and they'll look at our whole portfolio and they'll bless it. And they'll say, yes, we will insure it. Giving the purchaser comfort and allowing this very simple structure. So back to FICO. I just step back and just explain that. But again, if you're not getting debt on the project and you don't have traditional partnership flip, you should be able to get your cash equity comfortable with having a lower FICO requirement. And I can tell you that I've looked at swaths of customers and I didn't see any more defaults at 650 than 720 or 750. It's a curious stat because is FICO really a measurement of whether someone's going to pay their utility bill or not? It's effectively what you're becoming is your utility. And I would argue that one, utility bill is one of the last things people stop paying. You're not going to make it very long without power. You might be able to go a few months without paying your mortgage or your car or your cell phone, but power is probably the last thing you're going to stop paying. And two, as a solar provider, if you're providing a discount to what they would get to the grid, which is always the goal and required for third-party ownership, there's no reason for that customer to stop paying you. Defaults are traditionally very low in all our portfolios very low, less than a percent. You're seeing that with loans too. Like they started high back in their 10 plus years ago and now it's down below 1%. And it's like, well, what about that 1%? I remember when COVID was coming, everyone's like, oh, here we go. We're going to have this swath of people that can't pay their bill and just stop paying. And that really didn't happen like that. Everyone who was out of a job or had a hardship, they would generally call in and, hey, can I get on a payment plan? Like till I find work, till I do this. Sure. And of course you're amenable to that. The people that don't don't pay, generally they felt misled in the sale. They are angry with the installer because they failed inspection and it could have been something innocuous or didn't get a permit, which is a big deal. Or they stepped on their flower bread, they broke their gutter. It's something like that. It's more of a pain point where they're like, I'm not paying for this because I was misled. I was mistreated. I feel like you could have done this differently. So by aligning interests with the installer and giving them skin in the game, they're much more incentivized now to make sure that that customer is happy. Not that they're totally disincentivized before, but now you're totally aligning interests. If that's the real reason why people don't pay their bill, which it's going to be very hard to me off that mountain and I'll debate anyone anywhere about this because I've seen the data and I've talked to the customers. But if that's the real reason, then aligning interests with the installer, I think is going to go even further to continue to lower that default rate and provide better funds for the cash equity providers. Now you could make the argument and people have, well, you're you're not going to get debt because most debt companies are going to require a certain FICO for your portfolio. And maybe that's true. But what if I don't want to get debt for five years? What if interest rates stay high? And there's, okay, so how about this? If I deliver a portfolio that's outperforming every other portfolio, I'm pretty certain that I can 
get dead against that five years from now. Maybe I'm wrong, but we'll see how that shakes out. So as we get more and more adoption of solar, which we're seeing, and we're seeing more diversification in solar, meaning more states now solar works in and third party ownership is working in more states, right? It's not just California like it was years ago. The only way we're ever going to cross the chasm, so to speak, into the early majority is if we move from a total cost base to quality based sale. And I think you're seeing that now. You're seeing where people, I've talked about this probably, said this on every single of the 12 episodes or however many I've been on with you, is that you know when you're talking about crossing that chasm and having people no longer being sold solar, but start buying solar, people are going to buy solar from the companies who have five-star reviews, who have good BBB score. Everything that you could do at Google search and comes up right away. You're not going to go look to buy solar and go, I'm going to pick this company. They have a one-star you know, on solar reviews or Google or whatever. With that being said, I think this perfectly solves some of the friction points that exist in third-party ownership. Because again, when you look at it from a sales perspective, it's much easier to sell, a, we'll say a lease or a power purchase agreement, a TPO product than a loan. It's not a hard credit pool. That's one. But two, you don't have to worry about, does the customer have tax appetite? Do they understand the tax credit and how they're going to roll that back into their loan? It's much simpler. You were paying $300 a month. Now on average, you're going to pay $250. It's a lot simpler to sell, but the pain points are on the back end. It's the 70 plus photos you need and all the things that you need to do to satisfy the fund because the customer doesn't own it. And you need to have some assurance that this is a quality project that you're putting into the fund. And I think that's really what we're doing at Sunrays. We're aligning interest to deliver better funds and we're enabling it through technology. So we want to get down to less than 20 photos. We want to use drones or other imagery, depending on what that installer wants to use, but use that technology so we're not duplicating efforts. If you're using a drone for your site survey, you know exactly where the trees are and how tall they are. You shouldn't need to take a photo in every direction from the rooftop to show shading. So these are just common sense problems that we're looking to solve. And I just think there's so many layers. I mean, you can keep going deeper and deeper into what you can do with the transferability and the doors that this starts to open up to have a solar sale that has less friction. And that's the ultimate goal is to get something that's easy, eventually like direct consumers going to come to this market, just like you can buy a car, a house, a mattress, weird things online that I would have said 20 years ago was never going to happen. Solar will get there. We're maturing right now and it's inevitable, right? So how do you enable that sale? It's to remove friction. And that's exactly what we're doing. And I'll say this, I'll end here and turn it back over to you. And what we did really well at IGS was removing as much friction as we could with the box that we had, which is this partnership flip. Sure, there were some things we built in our tech that we would have went back and changed. And I talk about this all the time. So you could price the job this way if you want, like based on your red line or what your install cost is. But when you're building technology, it's like building a Lego set. And it's like, man, it seems simple, but I have to remove that bottom Lego. I can't do it. It makes a simple project extremely long, expensive, and complex. So now we took our learnings in the last 10 years from talking to companies, understanding the needs from my time where I still consult for Enterflow, which is the biggest residential solar platform in the country, right? And has all kinds of integrations. So you could take that learning and say, if I could start from scratch, we already built multiple systems that are just a cut above, but now it's world-class. I would say now we have a system through our technology that is world-class. So that's the other component. And I'm super excited that the reception's been great. Not to mention that, again, installers, you could see like, I'm really passionate about this, right? I mean, yeah, it's, definitely. I could go you forever go on on. because the other problem is like you're in, let's say Benoit that you owned a large installation company or super regional company and you want to exit or you want to go public or whatever your aspirations are. How do you in good faith work with a publicly traded competitor? How do you sell that story to your investors? So we're solving that problem. We're solving that problem. Now you can have equity. It's hard to have your own fund. It's a distraction to go raise capital and to build technology if you're an installer. You want to do what you do, which is sell and install solar. And we're enabling you now to participate so you don't have to make that choice of I'm only going to sell loans or where I got to go work with a competitor. No longer. Now you can be part of the fund. You can align interests. You can own the customer. You can get reoccurring revenue to increase the value of your company when you exit. And hopefully someday, near and dear to my heart, we can get rid of the FICO score. Because if you could save people money with cleaner, cheaper power, overwhelmingly majority of them, 
them will pay the bill. So that I'm out to prove that as well. I know there's some other companies that are out looking to do that and I applaud them as well. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot there. I agree with you. Like the less friction that you have for the customer, the easier the sale is going to happen and having interest aligned from the installer perspective by them having ownership of the project will create better customer experience, better solar installations. So aligned interest is so important. I totally agree with you about FICO not being a good representative of whether customers are going to pay their electric bill outside of their housing payment. You know, the electric bill is something that they're going to pay. It's interesting because... 12 years ago, I was educating the big banks when I worked at Tesla Solar City because we did some of the first residential tax equity funds and educating banks that it doesn't really matter what the credit score is. It really matters the electric bill and the priority of what a homeowner is going to pay, even in a financial situation, is their top priority because they can't really survive, especially in modern day without electricity. So it's interesting that this is still a debate. That was 12 years ago, 2010. Yeah. It was very hard at that time actually to get banks on board with that whole concept, but eventually they got comfortable with that. But it's interesting because credit score, it's just some old sort of metric that hasn't been adapted for years, but the credit community is comfortable with it and they haven't adjusted. It's interesting because we've interviewed Solstice, which is a customer acquisition company. They basically acquire customers for community solar. And if you go onto their website, they have like data on how customers will always pay their electricity bill. And then they created their own scoring metric on this sort of issue. So it's interesting that you talk about it because really to me, like there's no real risk, as you said, outside of these other things that are not really due to whether they could pay for the electricity and you're offering them discounted clean energy. I think the challenge is too, as you know, Nate, working for IGS, a third party energy supplier, especially in low income communities, like there's all these third party energy supplier companies and they get you with a really low rate and then it goes up substantially. So there's like a trust thing as well that goes along with that, but that's kind of separate. But you're right. Everything's going to eventually move online and ways of automating as you're talking about with drones and AI. Like I think we did talk about this on another podcast. Like you're going to be able to buy residential solar on amazon.com, you know, from some of these big retailers. It's not that complicated of a transaction. I mean, honestly, solar is actually pretty simple. It's just structuring it with all these complicated incentives for you to talk about how complicated this partnership flip model is just crazy to me, right? That's why like the transferability thing is such a big thing because that in itself, the tax equity structuring has created so much complexity in renewable energy and has slowed the renewable energy industry because of how complicated it's to structure a partnership flip, inverted lease, sale lease back to just be able to take advantage of the tax equity incentives. So like transferability is a huge way of streamlining and creates certainty and growth in the industry. And you're basically applying it to third-party ownership and to benefit the installer and everyone else involved in the transaction. Yeah, it's a great summary. I think it was somewhere around when I turned 40 where I made up my mind that a couple things, like just a few principles. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the best or the simplest sure. invention is the best. And the other thing is I decided I'm going to stop waiting around for other people people to do things. Like when you have a good idea and it's like, what? Nate has a lot of great doing. ideas, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that, but this is one that I've been waiting for for a while. And as soon as the IRA came out, I saw the opportunity. And I think like FICO, you have a lot of companies that sit around and just go, nope, I'm going to keep doing it the way we've always done it because it's always been done that way. And they're not even considering all the opportunity that the IRA opens up and all these conversations that we can have. And it's funny when you talk to, when I talk to old school finance, Finance people like you'll never get rid of FICO. You'll never do this because of that and this. And they have all these preconceived notions. And I'm just like, why? Just keep asking why? Because you need to get a certain return. Why? I mean, let's go down the rabbit hole. There are companies that don't get back leverage on their portfolio. I know because they did a fund where they didn't get back leverage. And like I said, why do you need to get it today? Why would you get debt today if, if you think interest rates are going to go down in the next three years? Wait. And I'm making it sound, I'm oversimplifying. So for the people listening, understand, I'm oversimplifying 
to make my point and you know, you can have somebody saying, well, this is why, and there's this and that. Yeah. Okay. Let's expand our mind a bit and start asking, why is it done that way? And under the new rules that exist, is there a better way? And let's figure it out. I know that you had mentioned earlier the active versus passive. And I think one of the interesting parts of figuring all of this out is with the IRS, they really don't have a good way to track these credits, which is why insurance, I think, is going to be important in the beginning. And I do think the tax industry will get commoditized for these credits. And, you know, I think of it like the analogy I use is eBay. People use eBay anymore. I don't know, but I back- do. I sold stuff on eBay. There you go. I should know. <laughs> yeah. But for eBay, I remember all the time and you could probably go look right now. I'll go out on a limb. I've been on eBay in probably 15 years, but you could buy like a $50 gift card and it was $49. I'm like, who is doing this to save a dollar? Well, imagine that on a massive scale where you're buying a million dollars in tax credits for $90,000. Where is the line? I think you're going to continue to see that get commoditized to where that return is really small because especially when you think of big numbers, if the transaction's easy, it's in Insured, then when you're incentivized to go do that for a hundred thousand or a million dollars, right? And why not? If someone else is willing to do it, that price is just going to keep getting driven up. Like right now, I think I heard on a Norton Rose Fulbright, who's a premier attorney for tax <laughs> equity. I think they had said like 88 to 94 cents on the dollar, depending if you have insurance. If you don't have insurance, you're going to get less. But I'm already seeing and hearing about transactions that are closing higher than that. So imagine, like you said, when there's all these platforms that anyone can go buy it and get insurance with it? Like, is it 98 cents on the dollar? Is it 97? I think it's going to continue to go up. But in the interim, there's so many other benefits that even if you get 94 cents, I still think it makes a lot of sense to continue to use the transferability. So there's all these different dynamics that go into it. But I guess my message is, why do we always have to do things the way they've always been done? There's new rules now. There's a better way. You'll never convince me that this way is not better. And we'll see how ultimately everything shakes out. Actually, the first public transaction, at least for transferability under the IRA, was Morgan Stanley did a large win deal. That was public. It happened in August. So deals are getting done. I actually did a podcast, episode 137. It was a discussion on transferability guidance for the inflation reduction at with Adam Shirley, who's a senior tax partner at Foley Lardner. So if you really want to learn about this transferability thing, it's definitely like a huge opportunity. And it's an opportunity once we get more guidance, hopefully to not, you wouldn't have to pay taxes if you invested in renewable energy projects on a federal level. I'm not an accountant or an attorney. So definitely you talk to your financial advisor, tax person about like the Inflation Reduction Act. And as Nate said, like we're still waiting for IRS guidelines on transferability that hopefully by the end of the year, which is not that far away, you'll get obviously a better idea of it. I agree with you. This is the way. I don't know if you're a big Mandalorian fan, Star Wars, but yeah, I think obviously it was created to basically reduce the friction that has caused in renewable energy transactions, the complicated structuring. And they took a lot of feedback, the Department of Energy, IRS, obviously the IRA to do that. I've actually been in not the transferability discussions, but on some of the other parts of the investment tax credit with the Department of Energy on these new incentives with the IRA. One thing that I was going to ask is like, what states are you focused on for residential with Sunrise Capital? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, as I mentioned before, there's been more diversity in states, especially for third-party ownership. And a lot of that has to do with just the electricity rates, because we talked about making sure customers are saving money and what that looks like. And the higher electricity rates go, which they've actually outpaced inflation, which I know I've talked about on and interest rates, for that matter, your podcast before, which isn't very common. But through the pandemic and now still, they're higher. So there's more opportunity in more states. We started in Florida. There's some reasons for that, but we're targeting basically every TPO market that exists. So Texas one, I really want to dominate. I think there's a lot of cool things you can do there being the only deregulated market. That would be its own episode. Both California and Texas have the complexity of really, you should have a battery, definitely need it in California. And I would argue definitely need it in Texas as well. But again, that could be its own episode. And then the mid-Atlantic Northeast. So by Q1, we plan on being in all of these markets. Right now we're selling and it's we have a candidly a traditional fund right now that we're deploying. Really good pricing. It's a really thoughtful fund. So we're doing that until we have the final guidance on the transferability, right? You could transact now, be a little bit of a risk. I think I started saying earlier, 
earlier and rabbit trailed myself, but you know, the whole passive active thing, like right now there's not a good way for the IRS to really to track these credits. So I think they're limiting the original guidance was it has to be passive income, which could get difficult if we want to give tax back to the installer because most of them are LLCs and they're active in the project. Now we wrote letters to the White House and IRS because I think they're being punitive without knowing it is unintentional sure. to the installer. They're the definition of active, but they don't want other people saying, oh, I'm active in solar because I know my cousin sells solar. So I understand what they're trying to solve for, but there isn't really a good system for them to track them. Again, that all comes back to insurance. And I guess what I would summarize is if it comes out and it has to be passive income, we're still going to find a way to make it work. There's different structures you can use. There's all different kinds of ways where we could still make this work and still give equity back to the installer. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like I'm laughing because it sounds like the accountants and attorneys will still be very busy with all this new guidance and structuring it. And it's interesting because I think there's been a lot of comments related to the active passive income versus active because then it limits the opportunity for transferability. But I think you're right. If you're able to structure it right, it probably could get around that. But it's obviously to be determined, but I agree with you on that. Is there anything else that we should know about Sunray's capital as we conclude this interview? I think we hit all the high points. Either people are going to like totally geek out over some of the weeds that we were in or their eyes are going to glaze over and they're going to fall asleep. So probably should end it here. And I would just say, you know, if anyone has more questions or if you have any retorts, I would love to hear them. <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn. I know Benoit's going to ask because we've done this so many times. So that's the best way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. You can look me up and all my info will be in the show notes along with Sunray's website. Or if you want to look at my consulting group, it's jovenelli.io. And again, that'll all be in the notes. So feel free to reach out to me. I try to respond to all of my requests on LinkedIn, which is getting more and more difficult, but I do my best. So happy to talk solar with anyone who wants to learn more or any installers out there that are interested in what we're building. Love to chat. Yeah, I'm really excited for you with Sunray's Capital. I appreciate, Nate, you sharing this as the first introduction to your new opportunity. And I think it's going to change the way solar is done in the future. I appreciate you. Thank you as always and look forward to another podcast in the near future. Definitely. Thanks, Benoit. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown.